Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Very well, thank good. you. And uh, we have a special guest today, yes. somebody that we've been looking forward to, uh, getting to know better because we've admired his writings for a long time. And uh, that is Robert Perry from Consortium News, and we're going to be talking about Russia Uh Bob, th thank you for being with us today. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Well, well, very good. Well, I want to talk a little bit about journalism today, uh, per se, but also about the article that you've written recently about Russiagate, uh, because there is so much going on, so much misinformation, so frustrating uh, for me in particular, you know, to read and listen to this stuff and spout it off day in and day out. And because I feel like I have to do my homework, I actually listen to, you know, the ordinary news. But uh, the reason why uh, I'm glad to have you here today is because I consider you uh, one a rarity. You know, you're you're actually a journalist. <laughs> you know, we've been looking for a journalist, and uh, this is fantastic. And you did some great work back on Iran Contra, telling the truth. And uh, you know. Everybody has an agenda, and we all have an agenda. Sometimes it's just to seek the truth and report it as we see it and be objective, but other people have other agendas. So uh, I'd like uh, you to sort of address this whole subject about where journalism is going. I mean, uh, and is it brand new, or has it been this way for a while and a lot worse, or am I just being overly concerned? Well, you know, journalism has always had that aspect of propaganda to it. Um, historically, you can go back and look at uh, the Pulitzer and Hearst uh, competition in New York, which uh, led to what they called yellow journalism and contributed to the really the beginning of the American international empire, that is the Spanish-American War. Um, and you so you've had it back and forth. There, there was more of a commitment later to do more of what was called objective journalism. That was to take out these sort of personal uh, opinions. Um, uh, that was more of what the Associated Press sought for, sought uh, in the way it approached the news generally. But there was always some element of bias that would creep in. Um, it's I think I would argue that it's gotten substantially worse um, in recent decades. Um, in part because uh, uh, the propaganda side of uh, the government has gotten very effective in terms of how it sells uh, information to the to the journalists, and partly because journalism itself has gotten more constrained in that there are fewer and fewer outlets, of uh, mainstream outlets anyway, uh, where people can make a good living. So journalists are more susceptible to that kind of pressure not to step outside the mainstream, not to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, I think, and we've seen, and now with the case of um, uh, President Trump's election in uh, last November, we've seen almost an, an hysteria take over across the mainstream press. Uh, the feeling has been that, that he's unfit, he should not be president, uh, therefore it's up to the media to somehow get rid of him. Um, and so the media has taken much more of a hostile uh, adversarial role ag against Trump than I've than I've seen before. I mean, there have been times when the press has, whether rightly or wrongly, uh, gone up against abusive politicians. But in this case, uh, there's been a desire to uh, to essentially set the groundwork for his impeachment and his removal. And 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 that's a case where the press has gone, I think, beyond what it mm -hmm. traditionally should do, which is to try to keep the American people informed as well as we can. Uh, with as, as honest and even-handed coverage as we can. Well, I think your reporting has proved that you're uh, seeking truth and doing good journalism. Daniel, Daniel has a comment and a question for you. Yeah, and I've been a, an avid reader. We talk about consortium news all the time. I think, uh, I think you do a great job on two levels. First of all, you cover the issues very well. You've been terrific on Syria, on Russiagate, and, but also in trying to force journalists to, to uphold journalistic standards. And, and this is sort of a takeoff in what Dr. Paul's question was. But, you know, before I came to work for Dr. Paul, I worked as a journalist. And it seems what, I, what we're seeing now is an absolute tossing aside of standard journalistic practices. If you're going to have an anonymous source, you need someone on the record to back it up and so on and so on. Are you seeing this, this rise of anonymous sources, this whispered sources, as the sole, as the sole evidence for a story? 
Well, you know, I'm not against using anonymous sources, uh, assuming they're well positioned and know what they're talking about. Sometimes when you're dealing with intelligence issues or issues of great sensitivity like that, um, you really can't expect people to go on the record. They'll get fired. They might be imprisoned if they do. Uh, so I'm not against people whistleblowing or coming to a journalist with, with important information. Now, obviously, the journalist should be skeptical of all information and try to see if there's a ways to confirm it or, or knock it down uh, in some other way. But, but often you do get, you know, the people going on the record uh, are often the, the politicians and the and the, uh, and the and and their underlings who have a reason to mislead you. So, so sometimes you do have to rely on anonymous sources. Uh, that's you, know, you should try to minimize it. You should be as clear as you can be, be to the reader about where this person is. Uh, but, but we can't. If you want to do intelligence reporting, you aren't going to get it all on the record. You know, uh, your article was good because I think it put it into proper perspective and uh, how much Russia was involved and is it significant. And I thought the one uh, example that you used might tell us a lot about uh, the whole problem. And that had to be the one of the Facebook uh, posting and the New York Times reported on dealing with the puppies. Just explain that to our audience. Uh, you know, what seems to me pretty bizarre. Well, part of the problem with the Russiagate uh, story is that it keeps keeps changing. It keeps evolving into uh, when one thing doesn't really check out or is certainly seriously questioned, like you know, the question of whether there was hacking and who might have done the hacking of the initial the initial information about the Democratic emails. Then we move to this other area that the Russians supposedly were planting information th across the internet. Uh, to create political division within the U.S. And, and when Facebook did two investigations, they found no evidence of this. And then they were confronted by Senator Warner, who personally flew out to Silicon Valley. And Senator Warner um, is not only vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee, but he's uh, a key legislator on high-tech uh, uh, regulation. So his what he says kind of matters. So then, so what we saw was that uh, Facebook went back and found hundred thousand dollars they said worth of uh, worth of ads that they attributed somehow to Russia now what's always lacking here is the context that was a hundred thousand dollars spread out over three years now uh, Facebook has uh, has an annual revenue of 27 billion dollars so a hundred thousand over three years doesn't amount to much and then it turns out that 44 percent only 44 percent of that a hundred thousand i guess you're talking about forty four thousand or so was spent prior to the 2016 election and then we started finding out more about what these what these ads were and and the new york times with a straight face it wasn't like they were trying to be funny <laughs> they they um, they reported that one of the one of the pages that would supposedly was Russia spreading disinformation was a page devoted to puppies and with pictures of adorable puppies. And so, so the New York Times suggested that maybe the Russians had some nefarious purpose in putting in uh, these ads with puppies. And so you started getting to this level of absurdity. Then and then and then um, uh, Twitter, uh, based on also this pressure found 201 uh, accounts that uh, that they had somehow connected to Russia but there are like there are 328 million monthly users of Twitter so <laughs> so again we're talking about the tiniest of pebbles being tossed into a very large lake and and okay if you want to focus on that sort of minor element and then make a big deal out of it at least you should put in as a journalist the context that is how many how small a number this is relative to this bigger picture but that wouldn't serve the narrative that that these stories wish to seek which is to portray this russian operation as this very uh, serious grave threat to american democracy um, so what we've seen is is the is the is the news media not act professionally not act in, a, in what, the way we're supposed to act which is to say here's the context here's the perspective the perspective and context don't work here because they would show that this is this is minuscule, <laughs> infinitesimal even. And right. that's, that was not what the narrative is desired to be, which is that this is a great giant thing that is somehow wiping out American democracy. So <laughs> the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, CNN, the rest of them leave out the context because the context would destroy their story. 
And that's not professional. That, that's, that, that is propaganda, not journalism. Well, this is why we're cheering you on uh -huh. to try to straighten some of this out, Daniel. And it's really the playing with language, Bob, isn't it? Because now all of a sudden, whenever there's an article about these Facebook and Twitter ads, these people are referred to as Russian operatives. It sounds very frightening. The word sounds like there are Russian spies. What if they're just Russian citizens? What if they're not from Russia at all? What if there are Americans living in Russia who happen to like cute puppies and take out an ad? Uh, they happen to be working in Moscow and take out. So that's all thrown by the wayside in favor of this new terminology, Russian operatives. The destruction of language is horrible. Well, also, if you look at the beginning, it was always, it was suspected links to Russia. I'm not sure what a suspected link to Russia is. And Russia is a nation of 144 million people. They're not all working uh, hand in glove with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> so what you're faced with is a situation that, uh, that, that, that instead of saying, we don't, so we don't know how it was determined that these people were, were sort of Russian operatives of any sort. And as you say, I mean, there are Americans living in Russia. There are also Russians who may have some interest in weighing in on American issues. When Facebook did their report on this, they noted that, of course, uh, Americans weigh in on Russian issues. Um, people all over the world weigh in on human rights questions, say, or political questions uh, that are not just related to their country, but to other countries. So th there, are a lot of, there are a lot of unanswered questions here, but what we've seen is instead of the uncertainty uh, sort of sustaining itself through these stories, you'll get the sort of suspected links to Russia phrase, and then the next time it'll be, it'll be expressed as certainty, and it'll be hardened up. And that's a, another sign of bad journalism. And I, and I taught journalism for, for a year or so, as well as been an editor and, and practice it myself. So there's this temptation, uh, especially among inexperienced journalists or those who don't have the highest of ethics to start off with something that is very carefully sourced and then harden it so it becomes from a maybe possibly to something but by the end of the story that is treated as certain and we've seen that with these stories but these stories aren't being done by some uh, by some kid in college at a, a J school this is being done by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other major news organizations. And the hysteria is so great that if you, if you look at these articles and you say, something doesn't smell right about this, they say, aha, you're in on it too. Now we got you. <laughs> this happens over and over. Yeah. So. Uh, Bob, I, I want to see if uh, you have noticed any change in attitude by your colleagues, uh, the people in the profession. Have things changed since uh, you've been involved in exposing some of this reckless journalism? Was there a time when you would get a lot more coverage in ordinary media? Has anybody blackballed you and say, no, we don't want to have them? Did, were you at one time on television, but you're not now? Have you seen any changes uh, under the circumstances? I know that the problem has existed for a while, but it's sort of unique right now because uh, uh, in, in a journalistic sense, uh, you're rather lonely at this particular time. But have you noticed a change by the outlets? Well, yeah, sure. I, I think there's been, uh, there's almost now a new paradigm in journalism. It used to be that we would say there are two sides to a story, at least. And sometimes there are more than two sides. And we'd want to sort of have those sides on. Uh, you know, responsible people. We're not talking about people running around with tin foil ha hats on. We're talking about you know people with serious credentials who have a different side of a story or different take on it. Um, and journalism was supposed to be a home for all those people, who um, so the American people could then sort through through this themselves. There was the whole idea of the enlightenment of the marketplace of ideas. Now, what we're now seeing is that it's the, the, new, the new paradigm is to prevent people from hearing the other side of the story, because the other side of the story is deemed somehow um, uh, disinformation or propaganda from an enemy, that it's Russian propaganda, so you're not allowed to hear it. And, and, and these news organizations take some pride in excluding the other side of the story. Uh, we've seen ca cases, for instance, like on the Magnitsky uh, mystery, which is a very important story because it, it re relates to the beginning of this new Cold War. And Magnitsky was this this accountant who was caught up in a in a money laundering scheme run by a major uh, a major uh, hedge fund guy, and um, 
and, and he was caught in Russia, and he was, uh, but then it became a case where he was then made into a, a whistleblowing lawyer, uh, and, and, and it became the basis of what's called the Magnitsky Act, which began this effort to demonize Russia. Now, the problem with this is that there's a whole other side to the story that, um, that is not being presented to the American people. Uh, that shows that this was probably a case of a of a very uh, a disreputable hedge fund operation um, getting caught. But instead of being accepting their 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 accountability, they decided to make it into something else that the Russians were abusing them. Now, okay, maybe it's one way or the other, but the American people should be allowed to hear both sides of that story. Uh, but when there was a very good documentary done by actually someone who was sympathetic to the Magnitsky side. But then in the midst of the documentary, he decided that it wasn't adding up. So he did a, his documentary shifts, shifts in, in mid, midstream and shows where he comes down and realizes this he's been, he's been duped by the Magnitsky side of this uh, story. That documentary has been effectively blackballed uh, in the West, in Europe, and in the United States. You can't, you can't see it. You're not allowed to see it. And, and that sort of thing is now happening more and more. Anyone who sort of says there's another side, for instance, to the Ukraine issue is silenced. You don't have you have to accept the State Department's version of, of what happened, not a more objective version of what happened. And we saw this also going back into 2002 and 2003 about the, about Iraq, when there were some of us who were writing this isn't adding up. These allegations about the Iraq WMD are not adding up. But those people were essentially sh shoved off the stage. Even someone like Phil Donahue was, was, was canceled by MSNBC because he allowed on people who criticized this march to war with Iraq. So there was this idea that, no, you can't allow that side to be heard. Uh, and that goes against what I was taught, what was taught in journalism, that you're supposed to invite various sides of controversies uh, onto the stage so people can hear the different arguments and make their own judgments. Now, the mainstream press is acting as if it's the, it, it, is, it is the arbiter. It decides what is going to be allowed to be heard by the American people. And, um, and silencing, I'm not just saying, these are people often with very serious credentials who have very different perspectives on these issues. Uh, so I think what we're seeing is a, something very, very antithetical to journalism, mm -hmm. but it's being now carried out by the major news organizations. The one thing you've pointed out, I think a number of times, Bob, as have others, is that now that they've created the hysteria about Russia being involved in everything uh, in our society, trying to distort everything and pit us against each other, now Congress has gone and appropriated millions of dollars to different organizations to seek out and find more of this. Thinking about the uh, Atlantic Council, uh, the German Marshall Fund, I'm, sh I'm sure you know about the Hamilton 68. In fact, the Ron Paul Institute shares with Consortium News the distinction of having been uh, attacked by Washington Post thanks to an anonymous group called Prop or Not that decided we are somehow secretly Russian propaganda. I mean, there are millions of taxpayer dollars now going into reinforcing something that wasn't re proven in the first place. Well, there was a bill passed in last December uh, signed by President Obama, which uh, authorized $160 million to combat basically Russian propaganda and disinformation was the way it was done. So what you're now getting as that money sloshes through the, uh, the, uh, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, and through academia, are more and more people trying to get a piece of it. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be, you're going to see more and more studies which will confirm the narrative of this, uh, this Russian uh, interference in American politics. Uh, and you're going to see more and more people who have who might who might question this be effectively silenced um, mm -hmm. because there'll be efforts to you know, to paint people dishonestly as uh, Russian propagandists for simply saying, hey, there's another side to the story. Yeah. You know, uh, to say there's another side to the story is now is now considered uh, somehow subversive. <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> there's one side of this story that I think uh, I guess short shrift, and that is. Uh, the hypocrisy of our government, you know, Russia's interfering with our elections. The majority of Americans probably believe that now, but uh, they rarely talk about, you know, how many elections have we been involved with, with coups and 
and assassinations and everything else. It's just out, outrageous. But the one question I have, because we will need to wind down here in a minute, uh, is this: um, the, how serious is what you uh, sort of uh, suggested early in the program? And that is, there are some people that their agenda is mainly to set up, for, uh, set the stage for impeachment. And you know that gets uh, pretty serious. Do you, do you think they um, that they could achieve that? I mean, this is outrageous of what's going on. But uh, do you think that uh, that becomes something of a serious nature that they could pull that off? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's not very for me to say. And that's a political question that will play out in the future. It depends about a lot of how things certain things happen in terms of elections and so forth. And certainly there are legitimate reasons to be very uh, upset about President Trump and how he's behaved. Um, but what's happened here is that from the very beginning, the Democrats decided they would seize on this Russia issue and exaggerate the heck out of it as a basis for achieving that goal. And that is and that's what that's what's really wrong here. I, and that's wrong for the, for the media to join in on it. It's also dumb for the Democrats, I think, although it's not my job to give them advice. But instead of looking at the real problems they face as a party, that is, why did so many of, these, of the white working class turn against them, uh, especially in the last election, but increasingly, instead of that, they're, they're trying to create this, this mythology about that the Russians stole the election from us, when that is such a, whatever the Russians did or did not do, it was a minuscule factor in what happened with the election in 2016. There, um, Hillary Clinton had a, had a number of other problems with her campaign that were far, far more significant than whatever the Russians may or may not have done. But instead of focusing on that, the Democrats have decided they're going to make this the, their, their way of somehow excusing their defeat and somehow uh, taking down President Trump. It's a very dangerous approach mm -hmm. yeah. for a lot of different reasons. And we've also been very frustrated, Bob, because we've always worked with progressives, a lot of progressives, and we were looking forward to having some more allies talking about the issues, some of the things that you're saying, that some of the things that Trump is going wrong on foreign policy, the excessive influence of the neocons in his administration, all of these issue-based things. We were looking forward to having these allies again that we once had. So we're very frustrated too. We say, come with us, you know, let, let's criticize together. But I, I know we have to wind it down, but I just want to also remind our, our viewers, consortiumnews.com is a great site. It's also reader funded. So if you like what Bob is doing, you know, you should support him. You should support what he does. We definitely uh, like what he's doing. We'd encourage everyone to keep that in mind. I also want to remind our viewers uh, that you can still get a copy of Dr. Paul's new book, Signed Personally to You. Uh, this is how you do it. It's a two-step thing that you can do. Uh, you have until the end of October. And I will turn it back to you, Dr. Paul, to close out. <laughs> Very good. And the main thing I want to do is uh, thank Bob for being on our program with us today. Uh, we've enjoyed it, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Very good, and I want to remind the viewers that uh, consortiumnews.com uh, is the place to go to follow what Bob's been doing. And I thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.